Today, the Living with Wildlife Illinois team is hosting a question and answer session about waterfowl and wetland habitat management in Illinois. I'm Laura Kamen. And I'm Kathy Andrews. Today we have with us Randy Smith with the Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Aaron Yader with the Illinois Natural History Survey, and Mike Serto with Ducks Unlimited. So before we dive in with the questions, let's just give each of you a chance to give the viewers sort of a brief background about your role with your respective organizations. And at the end of the Q&A, you'll have time to let people know about current research that's going on or if there's any habitat management projects that you want people to know about that are going on right now, we can cover that. Um, so that we don't have a traffic jam here, let's start with Randy and then Aaron, if you wanna chime in and then we'll finish out with Mike before we start the questions. Sure, thanks Laura and Kathy. Uh, I'm Randy Smith. I'm the Wetland Wildlife Program Manager for Illinois Department of Natural Resources. An alternate title would be the State Waterfall Biologist. Um, so I guess a brief bio would be um, born and raised in northern Wisconsin. Um, chased a lot of ducks, deer, uh, and, and rough grouse up in, up in the north country. Attended University of Wisconsin Stevens Point for undergraduate degrees. Spent some time working summers uh, in North Dakota, uh, getting uh, familiarized with the, the prairie waterfowl breeding landscape. Um, worked for Ducks Unlimited for a year actually, and then attended uh, um, Southern Illinois University for my master's degree. Worked for the Illinois Natural History Survey for about, uh, right about seven years. Um, and then I've been with Illinois Department of Natural Resources for about seven years as well. So um, that is how I ended up in central Illinois um, from Wisconsin, I guess, and still spend an awful lot of time uh, duck hunting, dog draining, um, and chasing the kids around and whatnot and trying to get them in the duck blind as much as I can. And that brings us to me. I'm Aaron Yetter with the Illinois Natural History Survey. Uh, work out of the uh, Forbes Biological Station and Frank C. Belrose Waterfowl Research Center here in Havana, Illinois. Um, I'm a native to central Illinois. I grew up a lot here in Havana um, along the Illinois River and I've been uh, I guess I went to school, both master's and undergrad at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And I've been doing waterfowl research for the Natural History Survey for the last 30 years um, along the Illinois River in central Illinois. Thank you. I'm Michael Sertle with Ducks Unlimited. Uh, I'm our regional biologist for roughly the northern two thirds of Illinois and the majority of Indiana. Uh, I currently work out of our Big Rivers field office with our Southern Illinois slash Kentucky slash Southeast Missouri biologist, Dane Kramer, uh, and our two engineers, Tom Kleemer and Ryan Connolly uh, from this office. We oversee the program uh, for the states of Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, and Missouri. Uh, originally, I'm from uh, Joe Davies County in Northwest Illinois. Spent most of my life growing up on the Mississippi River. Uh, I attended Western Illinois University for my undergraduate and Southern Illinois University for my master's degree. Uh, from there, I moved to North Dakota where I worked for the U.S. Geological Survey's Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center. Uh, and I got to do various research projects including waterfowl migration in the spring in the Central Platte R River and Rainwater Basin, uh, threatened and endangered species work on the Missouri River, uh, and, and wetland carbon sequestration work in North Dakota and, and Western Minnesota. Uh, I came to Ducks Unlimited uh, just about 13 years ago, uh, originally overseeing Western Michigan and Indiana. Um, I then have since transferred my position to where it is currently. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So our first question is from Steve in Jacksonville who has some concerns about, <clears throat> excuse me, who has some concern about the expense of taking his three boys duck hunting with them given the number of state and federal stamps that are needed. So his question is, has there ever been anything proposed for a single day duck stamp at the state or federal level? Yeah, I can probably discuss that a little bit. Um, there definitely have been various discussions about ways to make the cost of entry for waterfowl hunting 
um, I guess I'd say less daunting between the, the licenses and the, the two stamps, both the federal stamp and the state stamp. It, it, it certainly is an investment um, just to be able to pull waders on and, and go duck hunting for a day. Uh, I absolutely understand that. Um, I guess a point to remember is that you don't need to purchase state stamps for hunters that are younger than 18, and you don't need to purchase federal stamps for hunters that are younger than 16. Um, I, I, I haven't been a part of any discussions talking about, um, you know, a, a single day or, or just a couple of multi-day uh, stamps. Um, you know, I think that would be a, a real uh, law enforcement challenge uh, to understand who had stamps valid for whatever dates, unless it was somehow tied to a, you know, a short-term license or something like that. Um, I guess another important point is that the funds that are generated by these stamps go to protecting important waterfowl habitat and, and conducting important waterfowl and, and other wildlife conservation measures. The federal stamp funds go to the National Wildlife Refuge System, and, and that's a, a really um, efficient program for turning hunter dollars into habitat on the landscape. Um, and our state stamp funds, they go into the, the migratory uh, the Migratory Waterfowl Stamp Fund, and, and those funds are distributed to both in-state projects and then also uh, important habitat projects in, in Prairie Canada, where a large percentage of the ducks that we see and harvest in Illinois come from. Um, so, uh, you know, one, one side of the coin is that it's really expensive to take, you know, kids or, or anybody hunting for just a day or two. The other side of that is that, you know, those folks are benefiting from um, from the, the conservation funds that they're putting into the system that are, are really putting ducks in the air for them, whether they're hunting for a day or 30 days a season. Um, you, you know, they're, they're, all, they're all chipping in the same amount, and that's, that's an, important, um, an important concept for, for conservation. Very good. Mike or Aaron, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I guess I would add uh, to the... Illinois offers an apprentice uh, license um, so that they don't have to have, I, I don't believe they have to have a um, hunter education um, certificate for that apprentice license just to get them in the day of field um, at a reduced rate. Okay, we'll move on to the next question then. And this, this has to deal with the IDNR waterfowl surveys. And the question is from Trevor from Edwardsville. He asks, what value do the questions regarding how much money hunters spend on snow goose hunting, um, those questions were in the most recent waterfowl goose uh, survey, what value do those questions have um, for e uh, IDNR in managing wildlife habitat and the season structures? Um, perhaps Randy, you can give us a little bit of background on the surveys before you uh, fully answer that question. Sure. Uh, so what Trevor's referring to is the Illinois Waterfall Hunter Survey or the Illinois Snow Goose Hunter Survey. These are mailed questionnaires that are administered by the Illinois Natural History Survey um, through the University of Illinois at Champaign, um, through the, the Human Dimensions program there. Um, so these are mailed questionnaires that go out to hunters annually and um, there are there, there's a couple reasons I guess for for doing these. So for for the first part I guess is absolutely understanding uh, the number of hunters that we have on the landscape, the number of waterfowl that they're harvesting during various seasons and things like that, uh, and then also understanding hunters' attitudes about the timing of seasons and um, various habitat components, and, and we ask a whole a whole host of questions. Uh, a lot of them are repeated annually. A lot of them are kind of cover different topics in a, in a given year. Um, so one of those things is understanding our our hunter demographics, and so um, this is could maybe be a really useful tool in understanding where we need to be looking at for uh, various habitat programs or various hunting programs or things like that. It can also help us to understand how to target hunter recruitment efforts. Um, and and then another part of this uh, is is just understanding the economic input of or economic impact, I guess, of, of waterfall hunters. So when we have conversations with different entities, 
justifying hunting to some people the the conservation message and understanding you know like we just talked about with the waterfowl stamps uh how much money hunters are putting back into the system for conservation other folks those those conversations are not as important and so they maybe are more interested in understanding the economic uh impact of hunters and so doing these sort of studies we can just to some folks, it might help us justify our position. You know, for instance, uh, we asked these questions on the Snow Goose Hunter, Hunter Survey this year. We asked questions on the regular waterfowl hunter survey a couple years ago. Um, and it's it's really incredible how much uh, how much money hunters put into this, how much economic impact it can have on the local on the local economy. Um, particularly in rural areas that may not have a lot else going on, uh, especially in, you know, in the fall and through the winter and into the early spring when waterfowl hunting is occurring. Uh, those dollars that hunters are bringing into those areas can be, can be a really important part of the local economy. And being able to quantify that helps strengthen our position as hunters to, to folks who may, not, um, who may not be as concerned about the tradition of it or the conservation aspect of it. Uh, just to kind of expand a little on, on something Randy touched on, uh, for nonprofit organizations such as Ducks Unlimited, we have uh, public policy staff, and, and those policy staff work both in Washington, D.C. Uh, and in with the state. And as, as Randy mentioned, um, they want to know why, a lot of times, they need to allocate funding to some conservation program, uh, whether that is the Pittman-Robertson Act, which helps fund our state areas, uh, whether that is a land and water conservation fund, which helps to fund our national wildlife refuges, or, or it's one of the major federal grant programs like the North American Wetland Conservation Act or, or NACA, as you often hear at Ducks Unlimited. Uh, a lot of legislators, yes, they have a conservation concern, but a number of them also want to know what is the economic value of, of having hunting, of supporting these types of areas. Um, so it's very valuable for us as, as a nonprofit to also learn from these surveys uh, to better inform our policy actions, to, to help ensure that we have conservation, uh, first and foremost for wetlands and waterfowlers, uh, but in, in general uh, across the state and, and across the United States. The next few questions are about waterfowl zones and Mike from Highland says, thank you for taking his questions. And his first question is why is the Southern tip of the central zone for example, Madison, St. Clair, Monroe, Randolph, so far south, when the south zone goes so far north. So he asks, why not just make a county either one zone or another, as is done for the turkey hunting zones? Sure, this question is probably for me, I would imagine. Um, so I, I guess I would start by um, ducking it a little bit and saying that virtually all of our current zone lines were created prior to my time at, at IDNR. So I don't know the full backstory on um, how all of the different uh, jogs and zigs and zags came to be uh, originally. My understanding with that, uh, that zone line on the western part of the state uh, where the central zone uh, jogs south for a ways is primarily related to hunter requests for relatively early seasons there based on the types of habitat that they're hunting. So the majority of duck hunting, as I understand it, in that part of the state is in typically shallow, um, shallow wetlands, mostly in the Mississippi River bottoms in, in parts of those counties or um, maybe the Kaskaskia River bottoms a little bit too. Um, and, you know, those wetlands freeze relatively early in the year because they're shallow they attract a variety of different waterfowl, a lot of which are early migrants. And so when zone lines were being discussed at some point in the past, the hunters there asked for relatively early season dates so that they could take advantage of, um, of, of hunting when the ducks were present on their, on their various wetlands. In contrast to that, my understanding of the, the northern jog of the south zone on the east side of the state is that a lot of the hunting there is associated with uh, creeks and streams and rivers that uh, usually flood from mid to late January or begin to flood in, in later in the season in, in mid January or later. 
and ducks are attracted to those floodwaters as new food sources become available uh, as that water spreads out across the landscape. And those folks were just seeing that happen more often later in the year. And so asked for that zone line to come significantly farther north uh, to take advantage of that late season flooding and, to, and when the majority of ducks were available for them. Uh, they don't have as many maybe shallow wetlands that, that they're able to manage. And so they don't see their ducks earlier in the season, they see them later in the season. And, and um, you know, we were able to look at, um, or, or my, my colleagues prior to, to my time at DNR were able to look at some, um, some flood gauge data for some of those streams and rivers and could in fact uh, verify that that's when the majority of flooding occurred. And it, it seemed to make sense to have that, um, to, to take advantage of that with, with the zone line. Okay, Aaron or Mike, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would add just a little bit to what Randy said is that the, uh, the aerial survey, uh, aerial waterfowl survey data are used in um, determining those zone lines as well. And so um, depending on, on which side of the state you're talking about on that, that central zone dip down there um, towards St. Louis is uh, related somewhat to the lower Mississippi River uh, waterfowl survey and the abundance of ducks that are there at uh, certain times of the year. So they use the waterfowl survey data in addition to everything else to establish those zone lines. Okay, we'll move on to the second part of, part of Mike's question and it is why not try a split season for at least part of the state. He goes on to say that about half of the hunters in the central and south central zones feel that the season is too early, whereas less than 10% respectively believe that it is too late. Aerial surveys for both south and south central zones show a significant increase of mallards during or in January as the reverse migration begins. However, by the time they get back to the south central and central zones, our seasons are done. In addition, a seven or 14 day break should take pressure off of migrating birds and retain them in Illinois, while additional migrators fly into Illinois, building the numbers. As the second part of the split season opens, hunters should experience success somewhat similar to opening day, which would maximize hunter satisfaction, which IDNR has listed as a goal. So gentlemen, what are your thoughts about a split season? And Randy, we'll go ahead and start with you on this one. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. So some of our ability to experiment or use different season structures is limited by the federal frameworks. And so I guess the little bit of backstory there is that unlike deer, turkey, or upland game, where states have really the flexibility to establish seasons for the most part however they want waterfowl are much more limited in that season frameworks or, or basically the outside bookends of what we can do with waterfowl regulations are established through a cooperative process between states and the u.s fish and wildlife service so uh, the states work with the service through the the different flyway councils so Illinois is part of the Mississippi Flyway Council. So we have input on how, how seasons are allowed to be structured, but still the, the Fish and Wildlife Service ultimately sets kind of those, those outside margins that we have to stay within. So currently states that use four zones like we do in Illinois, we're not allowed to use a split season along with our four zones. We would have to drop to a, we'd have to drop back to three zones in order to institute split seasons. Um, Illinois was uh, one of the states that pushed to get four zones uh, going back about 15 or so years now, 10, 15 years ago now. Um, hunters in Illinois really believed that we needed, we didn't need a split, what we needed was really a, a fourth zone um, because of the difference between migration timing in the different parts of the state. Uh, we'd, have to, we'd have to take that zone away or a zone away. We'd have to figure out how to combine two of our zones or rearrange our zones in order to, to use those, to use splits. Um, and uh, up until about five or so years ago, uh, split seasons were really unpopular as gauged by 
hunter responses to that mailed Illinois waterfall hunter survey that we talked about a little bit before. Hunter preference was for contiguous seasons, not split seasons, and for four zones rather than fewer zones and going to split seasons. Uh, hunter attitudes have changed a bit recently, and the in, in looking at a three zone structure with split seasons has become much more popular in the last couple of years. The challenge with that is that virtually every hunter I have talked to about trying split seasons has a different idea for how they would combine zones and institute splits. So we really need to evaluate through, probably through that mailed survey, just how to, how to try that. Right now, if we tried to institute uh, fewer zones and splits, we'd really struggle to, to satisfy to satisfy more hunters than we than we dissatisfy because we really don't know how to structure things right now. We just don't have uh, good information on it, and I I fear that we would we would mess it up really badly uh, without without better information. Um, yeah, I think that I think that pretty well pretty well covers it. So I don't want to throw anyone under the bus here, but I know Missouri has established a split at least in their central zone and southern zone in the last year or two. Um, do you, I, I don't know how they're uh, faring with that, with that split, but do you guys uh, have any information on that? I, I don't. The last time we were able to make uh, split and zone line changes would have been for the 2016 through 2020 seasons. So they would have had to, they, they could have, um, they could have chose that. Uh, they could have chose to use fewer zones and splits, or to, to use three zones with splits in that time, and then uh, set their date so that they didn't have a split prior to that. Um, they, you know, you're not required to use the split if you don't want to. Um, if you still just want three zones, you don't have to use, take a split if you don't if you don't want to use it. Um, I, and I would absolutely need to reach out to, to colleagues there in Missouri about how that has gone um, and how hunters have reacted to it and whatnot. But there is absolutely value to, um, as Mike, I think it was Mike mentions, um, that you kind of get a second opening day effect. And, and we know that opening day is our, our largest day of participation and our largest day of harvest virtually around the state. So a second opening day absolutely could contribute to hunter success and hunter satisfaction. Good. Mike, anything to add on that one? Uh, no, I think Randy covered it pretty solidly with the, the federal aspect of it and, and the whole flyway council uh, group decision making of it all. Okay. Well, then we'll switch to the next question, and uh, it is about seasons. So we'll transition the discussion now to season dates and the IDNR five-year plan process. Mike's question is, several states have Canada goose seasons one to two weeks into February and more than 65 days of duck season. Why are we limited to 65 duck days and a goose season that ends no later than January 31st? Randy, you want to tackle that one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so again, this is uh, another example of regulations that uh, we don't have a lot of flexibility to experiment with, uh, at least for the, the, the duck side of it. Um, the Mississippi Flyway, so there's 14 states in the Mississippi Flyway, roughly from Minnesota to Michigan in the north to Alabama to Louisiana in the south and, and pretty much all the states in between. Um, all of those states are limited to a maximum of 60 days for duck season. Uh, that is a, a federal regulation and, and we cannot, we can, we can use fewer than 60 days, which I don't see a scenario in which we would, but we can't go over 60 days. Other states uh, that are in either the uh, Central Flyway or the Pacific Flyway have fewer hunters. And so those, the frameworks for those states uh, allow for more than more than 60 days of hunting. Uh, they, they're allowed to use 70, 70 days or 74 days in some states uh, and 107 days in, in the Pacific Flyway. Uh, the Atlantic Flyway falls in with the Mississippi Flyway and only being able to use a maximum of 60 days. So, so that's a federal regulation uh, that, that we don't have any control over um, currently. Uh, the, the Canada Goose 
side of that, we, we do have more flexibility in Canada goose season structure and timing. Um, we certainly can go until February 15th with Canada goose hunting in the Mississippi flyway, but we've been, um, I will say purposely conservative with our Canada goose hunting regulations in Illinois over uh, really for, for quite a while. The reason for this is largely that Illinois still depends quite a bit on the subarctic breeding populations of Canada geese that breed up along the Hudson and James Bay in Canada um, and then migrate to migrate to Illinois. Those are a lot of the birds that used to winter in southern southern Illinois historically. Uh, we still we still harvest a pretty high proportion of those birds of our, our total Canada goose harvest. And those populations have remained relatively stable through time, but it had, had been kind of on a long, slow decline from, from kind of the, the heyday back when, you know, there were, you know, the better part of a million geese wintering in Southern Illinois. Um, so we have kind of kept things conservative to avoid putting additional strain on that population. In recent years, that population has stabilized and even started to increase a little bit. And so we just this past year liberalized to three Canada geese per day for our daily bag limit, um, an increase from two that had been the daily bag limit for years and years. And we really want to evaluate how that impacts harvest and to make sure that we're not putting any additional harvest pressure on those Southern Hudson Bay breeding birds uh, before we, we liberalize further and, and really talk about uh, ex, ex, extending the season into February. Um, there's a chance for that. Uh, it's again becoming a, a more common theme uh, as measured by our hunter survey results. Um, the other side of that is that it would also impact the spring light goose conservation order, so spring snow goose hunting season. We can't start that spring conservation order season until all other season closed, so we would have to shift the, those dates of that season back as well. Um, hunters may be okay with that, but that's something that we something that we need to understand to make sure that we're um, you know we're not just catering to a few folks that this is a uh, um, it would be a change that would be broadly supported, hopefully. Okay, along the same line, we're gonna go back to Trevor from Edwardsville who, relate, who asked a related question um, about the five year waterfowl season date and zone line. Uh, where does this process stand and when will the public have a final comment period? He also asks, why did the survey and constituent group consensus data differ from the draft proposal? So I think this is probably a question for Randy. Probably, thanks Kathy. This again kind of relates to federal frameworks. Um, so what Trevor's referring to is that we're uh, required to establish zone lines for five year periods. That's a, another federal regulation. We've been working on this process really since uh, late fall 2019. And it's a, a pretty in-depth process that includes reviewing multiple years of hunter survey data, meeting with constituent groups, uh, developing proposals, uh, holding open houses, um, presenting information to uh, the Natural Resources Advisory Board and getting their input on it as well. Um, are, are any zone line changes that we would have uh, implemented were originally required to be turned into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by April 30th, uh, but COVID-19 kind of threw a wrench in that, and so that date's been pushed back to July 1st, which is really right around the corner uh, now. Um, so the uh, the Natural Resources Advisory Board actually held a, a public conference call uh, this past Monday on uh, June 22nd. Um, and that was really probably the last chance for public, uh, any sort of public input, given the, the how close we are to the, the final due date for the Fish and Wildlife Service now. Um, I guess the other part of that is that the uh, the draft proposal is not following constituent group and survey consensus uh, is, is a bit complicated. So I guess the first thing to understand is that uh, we use a couple different types of data or information for for making decisions on or, or guiding decision making on on how to establish uh, seasons and zone lines, season dates and zone lines. 
Um, so really we, we are looking at social data. So that's the hunter preference data from the mailed surveys, from the open houses, emailed comments, meetings with constituent groups, and then also the biological data from the aerial inventories that Aaron and some of our, our DNR biologists fly, uh, um, freeze up data from environmental data, and, um, and then hunter harvest data, which we look at as well um, from the, the US Fish and Wildlife Service parts collection survey. Um, so if, if the hunter preference data and the biological data don't align really well, we have some really tough decisions to make and some compromises to, to decide on um, for trying to figure out how to maximize hunter opportunity, hunter success, and, and um, and then also try to meet the desires of, of the hunters. And so um, when we're talking about a, a relatively big change, like changing a zone line, um, what I'm personally looking for is, is pretty broad support um, for a change. Uh, you know, I'd like to see a majority of hunters supportive of such a change. Um, what we, what we, got from the mailed surveys and from um, from open house uh, attendees was kind of a, a more of a weak plurality. 40 some percent of folks in favor of a change, mid 30 percentage of folks not in favor of a change. So that, that tells me that, um, and then another fairly large percentage of folks that, that maybe didn't have a preference. Um, and so that, that tells me that we stand to um, dissatisfy potentially nearly as many hunters as we as we could satisfy by making a change. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, so you know, it's it's kind of hard to implement something if, if you don't have at least for me to endorse something if we don't have really really strong support for it. Um, I, I guess a. a Final thought on that is it's not really the the hunter input information isn't isn't so much a vote as it is one one piece of the information we use to guide the decision making process. All right, then we'll move to the next question, and that comes from Josh from Marion, and he would like, like to know what is the possibility of instituting a stop time earlier than what's implemented for daily waterfowl hunting. Um, he adds, it's, it used to be done for the SIQZ. For those of us who don't know, what is the SIQZ? Southern Illinois Quota Zone. Okay. Years ago with Canada geese, uh, since the geese quit coming, it seems so did the practice. Stopping the hunting at 3 p.m. daily would allow the waterfowl to enjoy in peace what was created for them. Um, but the state lands stop at 1 p.m. Multiple hunting clubs in Southern Illinois have implemented their own shooting times, seeing great success. Um, Randy, do you wanna address this first? I guess this question gets a little bit into the theory of refuge or refugia a little bit. Uh, I know Aaron and other folks at the Natural History Survey have done some research on this, so I'd, I'd like to hear his thoughts on it as well. Um, from my perspective, I think this is kind of a trade-off between um, providing birds a chance to rest in the afternoons and then also providing hunter opportunity. So federal regulations don't, um, don't call for uh, a stop time earlier than sunset. And so from, from my perspective, trying to dictate to private landowners that they need to, what they need to do on their property regarding hunting is, is kind of a, a hard sell in, in my opinion. That's maybe a little bit of, of overreach. Um, if folks want to institute those practices on their own and they're seeing increased success because of it, uh, that's, that's great. I'm all for that. And um, I understand that that creates conflicts when, you know, one property owner institutes a stop of hunting and maybe the neighbor does not. And um, so that, you know, maybe that's uh, chasing birds off of their property or, or whatever, or, or perceived conflicts there. Um, I think the reason that those uh, that those stop times were instituted on state lands, uh, I, I would guess that it is trying to provide temporal refuge, so basically short-term refuge, and allow the birds to to use some of the habitat that's provided, and hopefully establish a behavior pattern that would make them available to hunters, you know, the next day or or days sometime in the future. Um, the the use of those stop times 
regarding Canada geese and the old Southern Illinois quota zone. Um, again, that was before I had a whole lot to do with, with waterfowl management in Illinois. I would, I would guess that maybe because Southern Illinois wintered such a large proportion of that total population that there maybe was um, more desire to provide some daily protection to those birds. And there was also a, a quota on how many could be taken rather than just a daily bag limit. There was also a season long quota. Uh, and so maybe it um, extended how long it took hunters to reach that quota to provide more days of, of hunting. You know, I guess I'll jump in here too. Um, there's been various research, uh, a lot in Mississippi and some in Illinois on, um, on the number of days that you hunt an area during the week and the number of hours that you hunt a, a given unit. Um, basically what they found is uh, that the, the ducks are pretty uh, flexible and they get habituated to these minor changes that we try to implement to fool them and they're smarter than that. Um, that uh, that hunting, a, hunting an area, this is a little bit off of the topic, but hunting an area two days a week as opposed to four days a week or only hunting them in the mornings as opposed to the afternoons um, doesn't really affect hunter harvest. And, and so we've, the, the mindset has been to just provide hunting opportunity then if, it, if, we're not, if it's not affecting the birds or affecting harvest to provide the opportunity so that the hunters can capitalize when they have the opportunity to go. Um, there has been, we did a study here in, along the Illinois River a few years ago where we looked at hunting or what, what is the exclusion zone or what is the, what is the effect around a hunting party um, to uh, the b distribution of birds and we found that over all waterfowl species that um, the, the area of disturbance was about uh, half a mile um, that we could, we, could, we could detect hunter disturbance. Um, I know Joe Lancaster did stuff in Mississippi where he looked at um, hunted areas and sanctuaries and sanctuaries and um, obviously birds did um, use sanctuaries more than hunted areas during hunt days, but on non-hunt days, um, the day following that they didn't hunt, there was a more equal distribution of the birds. So um, basically the birds just figure out, or the ducks figure out um, when we're trying to hunt them and they avoid us and, and even shift their patterns to hunt at night or to forage at night instead of during the day. Josh has a second question um, to cover. So he says, uh, valiant efforts have been carried out to create and install at least 100 nest boxes in Williamson County every year. These birds hardly have the yolk out of their eyes before they're being shot by the young uneducated hunters. These animals are a resource and if we continue to put the amount of pressure on them that we do, we will not have anything to hunt or conserve. So his question is, can the early goose season be stopped? Randy, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Laura. Um, I, I think so. I, I first of all, I think what Josh is referring to, or I'm reasonably sure, is the uh, population of resident or temperate breeding Canada geese uh, in southern Illinois. Um, I'll, I'll definitely reach out to Mike for some thoughts on this as well, since he did his master's research on on geese breeding in southern Illinois. Um, from my perspective, this is a, a trade-off with hunter opportunity. Um, the number of participants in those September Canada goose seasons is, is not incredibly high, but the, the folks that participate in it really, really enjoy it. Um, we also don't harvest a overwhelming number of geese during that September season. The majority of harvest comes uh, during parts of the goose season that are during duck season or after duck season. Um, the number of hunters and the level of harvest during that September season has been uh, really pretty stable through, through time, I would say over the last five to 10 years anyway. Um, another important part about that September season is that uh, the geese are, are, are really still localized and despite some parts of the state really wanting more geese, like in Williamson County, there's a lot of parts of the state uh, who feel that their, their resident 
breeding population is too high. And that September season allows for harvest specifically on those birds really prior to the geese kind of mixing up and migrating geese coming in from other areas or just even local geese kind of moving around. So if, if you know, there's an area that uh, is having some, some human goose conflicts because of abundant geese, uh, that's a really good opportunity for hunters to try to target those and maybe bring those numbers down without using, um, without using other techniques. It's kind of a win-win. Uh, the folks might have re get reduced goose numbers and hunters have a, have a good opportunity. Um, the September season also seems to pre get pretty good recruitment tool. Uh, the weather's nice. You don't have to bundle up as much. You can go in a, you know, jeans and a t-shirt or whatever. Uh, and the geese are a little bit less wary. So there's a pretty good opportunity for, um, for, uh, for success. Um, it, 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 you know, it, from, I guess from my perspective, uh, I, I understand the, the trade off with trying to build up populations and hunters harvesting some of those birds in September, but, um, we have a, a pretty robust population of, of resident can of geese in Illinois, and um, I, I guess I don't see it being very likely that we would um, that we would end that September season. That makes sense, Mike or Aaron. Anything to follow up on that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> uh, kind of as Randy, <laughs> two things. Uh, as Randy indicated, uh, I did my master's work. Actually, I, I have a thesis here in my office on nest success, gosling growth, and adult body condition of resident giant Canada geese nesting in Southern Illinois. Um, so I spent a couple years at SIUC uh, doing research on, on literally this question. Uh, what we looked at was a comparison of Southern Illinois um, to other parts of the state that we're seeing faster expansion of, of resident Canada geese the geese, uh, as Randy said, we, we now call temperate nesting Canada geese, previously giant Canada geese, uh, the, the geese nesting in the park, basically. Um, they were expanding at faster population rates in, in northern Illinois and central Illinois than they were in southern Illinois. So what we did is we decided to take a look at, well, what is the difference uh, between these, these parts of the state? Um, the geese were first reintroduced, if you will, uh, to old surface coal mines in Fulton County, Illinois in the late 80s um, and other places thereafter, but that was kind of the start of it. Uh, that research was done out of SIU, so we had the original data there at the university uh, for when the geese were first introduced, looking at what their, their nesting ecology was. Uh, so that, that was basically my study as I, I Traveled all over Southern Illinois, um, marking hundreds of nests, capturing thousands, hundreds, thousands of goslings uh, over a couple of years. Traveling the state with the DNR uh, during their goose banding, uh, capturing geese, taking measurements of the wing, of the middle toe, of the length of their head, of their weight, uh, and also traveling between different parts of the state to take samples of goose forage. So what we found was nesting success is pretty much the same throughout the state, at least high enough that it, it should not negatively impact local populations. Clutch size is, is basically the same throughout the state. Um, and what we found though, however, was adult body condition was better uh, further north in the state than it was in Southern Illinois. So what we looked at was the average hatch date for Canada geese. Well, it's only about a week different between Northern Illinois and Southern Illinois. The big catch is Southern Illinois' vegetation starts growing on average about a month earlier than Northern Illinois. Goslings need those fresh shoots to grow fast in their first year. So what it basically comes down to is they're not as well fed in Southern Illinois because what they're feeding on in general uh, is a little bit more rank. It's less nutritious than what we're seeing in, in other parts of the state. And how that plays out then into future years is a Canada goose generally does not try to nest a female uh, until three years of age or so. Well, if you kick that out to five years of age because she grew slow, she couldn't put weight on, it negatively impacted her ability to find a mate. Now you've also exposed that goose to that many more years of potential predation, hunting, starvation before they even lay a nest. And the first nesting attempt usually isn't successful. So now we're looking at places like Northern and Central Illinois, where a first time pair might pull off a successful nest in year three or four, 
In Southern Illinois, it could be five or six. So while hunting is, is a good topic to discuss, we also know from this data that the geese just simply grow a little bit slower and therefore they reproduce a little bit slower than they do in other parts of the state. I can say personally from having lived in, in Southern Illinois uh, three times now over the last 20 years, um, there's more geese than there was 20 years ago. There's not a lot more, but there's more geese. And we've had early Canada goose hunting during that time. So I, I appreciate the person's concern. You know, maybe this is an opportunity to help educate young hunters that, that they feel are uneducated. Um, you know, recruitment is, is a huge thing at the federal, state, nonprofit level of, of getting young people and, and, and women and just new adults in general into hunting. Um, these early seasons help provide that. Uh, so I, I think it's a really good question, um, but it definitely has, has a little bit more uh, than the hunting to do with it when we, when we look at that nesting ecology issue. Very good. So we're gonna switch gears again uh, with a few questions about habitat development and partnerships that are underway. The next question that we got was, what is the relationship with the state Ducks Unlimited and federal refuges such as Crab Orchard Wildlife Refuge? A number, uh, excuse me, a smaller group of individuals involved in local not-for-profit have raised over $10,000 in the last couple of years purchasing stuff log structures, fuel and storage tanks, et cetera. Um, so teaming up with other organizations, we could do great things in Southern Illinois in respect to waterfowl and wetland management. Um, who'd like to chime in on, on this one? Ducks Unlimited partners with federal, state, uh, other nonprofit conservation groups or organizations um, through, throughout the state. The general process, because Ducks Unlimited really is not a landowner, or a land manager is that one of those, a, a land managing partner, such as the DNR, um, contacts Ducks Unlimited and says, hey, we think we have a project, uh, for example, replacing a water control structure that we need so we can raise and water, raise and lower the water in this, this wetland management unit at, at John Doe State Fish and Wildlife Area. Okay, that's, that's within Ducks Unlimited's conservation mission and it's part of the job we do. So then myself and the DU engineers we have here at the office, we go up, we meet with the DNR on site at, at John Doe State Fish and Wildlife Area. We look at the project and we discuss with them what are their desired habitat outcomes? What are their management goals? What do they want as the end product of, of this project? With that information, um, myself and the engineers then do a bunch of project uh, designing and conceptual planning where we will come up with a, a sketch essentially of what the project will look like. Um, we then work with the partner. So for example, uh, the DNR to say, okay, the project is going to cost, let's just random number here, uh, $250,000. How do we want to look at funding that? And that's where we look at things as I discussed before and when I mentioned policy as can the DNR access Pittman Robertson money. Uh, the revenue from the sale of firearm or tax on the sale of firearms and ammunition that, that each state uh, can, can bring back into its state for conservation. Uh, can we look at the, the North American Wetlands Conservation Act, NACA, as, as I had mentioned before? Um, we get that figured out. We say, okay, are there other folks that want to work with us? We say, yeah, we have the Friends of John Doe State Fish and Wildlife Area. They're a great local support group. They could bring five, ten thousand dollars to the table. And we work with those folks to then secure the funding we need to then go implement and, and deliver that project. Um, for Crab Orchard specifically, my recommendation would be for the Fish and Wildlife Service to simply uh, contact our Southern Illinois biologist, Dan Kramer, um, if, if they have a project that they might be interested in you working on. Um, I, I previously covered Southern Illinois and I looked at some stuff a number of years ago. Um, but it just somehow just didn't work out at the time. Um, I'm sure Dane would love to have an invite to, to look at things. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, within Southern Illinois, um, to, to kind of that, that point uh, of, of making, it, making it really something special for waterfowl, it, you know, we have a very strong program with the Shawnee National Forest, with Cypress Creek National Wildlife Refuge, 
Uh, Dane is building great relationships with, with the DNR and their, their state natural areas and some of their fish and wildlife areas down there. And, and we hope to continue to expand that to areas, you know, such as Middle Mississippi Refuge and Pyramid, uh, Rend Lake, Crab Orchard, things of that nature. Um, so I would say as far as DU, we're, we're willing to kind of look at any wetland project and just, just feel free to reach out to us. So the next question is from Gretchen from Coulterville, and she has a two-part question here. The first part is, how do you see changes in weather and flooding patterns over the last five to seven years necessitating a relook at waterfowl management area practices and plans? And the follow-up question is, do you anticipate that we should be looking at an overhaul of sorts to address these changes that are proving very challenging in some public land waterfowl hunting areas? I agree with Gretchen that the with climate change and and urbanization and uh, agriculture that we are we are manipulating or the the climate patterns and river flooding schedules are uh, being greatly affected um, across the landscape and especially in the Illinois River Valley. Um, I, I pulled together some data for a talk last winter and found that um, over the last 13 years we've had a, a growing season flood. 60% um, of the time. So that means that our, our waterfowl food uh, that we provide, that we try to manage for to provide stopover habitat during fall and spring has been wiped out in 60% of those last 13 years. This is predicted by climatologists to get worse. Um, this flooding and, and irregular uh, flooding regime is predicted to get worse um, in the future. And we're going to have to come up with different scenarios to provide habitat uh, on the landscape. And uh, I think Randy and, and Mike have been working together to uh, look at new areas uh, that we could that we could uh, maybe put in some some wetlands and managed areas behind behind uh, levees that that might be um, that might not, might not be flooded so frequently. Um, but in the, in the meantime, we still have to maintain our areas that we currently have along the river and not abandon them and uh, get use out of them when we, when we can uh, to provide the resource for the birds as they come through. Yeah, I guess I, I would absolutely agree with Gretchen as well and, and with everything that Aaron said that, um, you know, we've really struggled with management, um, not just in the Illinois River Valley, certainly in the Illinois River Valley, but, but really statewide. Um, a, lot of our, a lot of our waterfall management areas are associated with, um, with riverine habitats or, you know, wetlands along rivers or reservoir uh, wetlands, whether, whether reservoir type lakes that are associated with, um, with rivers and the wetlands associated with those lakes. And pretty much Anything associated with a river in Illinois in the last handful of years has experienced flooding, probably during the growing season. Um, I think a couple parts to this are that we need to, as Aaron mentioned, and, and Mike and I have talked about a lot and are, are looking for opportunities to work on. For one, putting habitat behind, um, behind high levees that is going to be more of a guarantee that we're going to be able to manage effectively even when there is unseasonable flooding. And then also to make our existing sites more resilient to that flooding uh, by upgrading, um, upgrading our infrastructure or fixing our infrastructure, and um, you know so that it can it can handle the flooding without getting tore up, um, and that we can either uh, add water or get rid of water um, more efficiently with the shorter window of opportunity that we have to, to manage habitat. And, and so that's probably going to, going to also mean changing our habitat management strategies a little bit. Um, historically, on a lot of our state managed hunting areas, we relied on row crops uh, for a lot of our food resources for waterfowl. Most row crops have a really pretty long uh, growing season that they require in order to, to mature and, and produce um, a good food resource for waterfowl. Um, I think we have to get better at using uh, more natural management regimes that will be tolerant of some flooding and that have a shorter um, time period to get to maturation to, to, to be providing um, good waterfowl food on the landscape. Um, 
you know, just, just so like moist soil management would be a great example of that where you draw down the water in the sometime in the, in the summer, uh, kind of dry the wetland out and allow a bunch of annual plants to, um, to grow and produce seed. Uh, just doing moist soil management is one thing, but doing really good moist soil management is completely different. And um, when, uh, when water levels permit, uh, I think we need to be able to, to do the best management that we can, um, or we're going to continue to struggle with attracting waterfowl to our, our managed areas. Yeah, I, uh, just to add to what Aaron and, and Randy both said, uh, they both really drove home, uh, you know, the concerns that, that are there and, and how we look to things in the future. Um, so just kind of at BU, the way that we partner with folks like Randy and the DNR is, is we take these things into consideration and, and we basically ask one question, what can stay the same and what needs to change to be viable into the future? It's, it's kind of what it, that comes down to. That's why we talk about what's behind the levee, what's in the valley. Um, so it, it kind of depends on, on what your situation is. Something simple is you raise a berm two feet to try to keep out a little bit more flood water and you keep the way it always was. Uh, a little bit more of a next step is maybe we add multiple water control structures or put in a large spillway that can handle these big flood pulses, take the water in, but also get it out, get it off of the, off of the, the moist soil, the habitat or whatever during the growing season, so it doesn't get killed. So, so that we have something come the fall and in the migration season. Or uh, it can be a, a complete change. Um, for example, it could be a scenario where years of flooding has killed out a, a, a flooded, what would have been a forested wetland in the bottoms, and now it's become marsh. Okay, well then what do we do to the management infrastructure to change that from managing for flooded green tree timber to now being able to incrementally manage for marsh? So any, any one scenario could work given, given the, the situation you're in. Um, but the goal at the end of it is to provide the site managers with the tools they need to help us provide the best waterfowl habitat we can, not just now, but as we look in the future years on these predictive models of, of this becoming uh, something we, we should come to expect uh, if any given year. Okay. Um, one final question that we received from the Facebook comments uh, comes from Pete in Byron. And I really love this question because it talks about the history and the future of Illinois and wetlands. Pete says that historically, Illinois had landscape-sized wetlands throughout the state, including a 100,000-acre complex that spread across Lee, Whiteside, and Henry counties that dwarfed Horicon Marsh um, and was a wetland of international importance. In Illinois, the recent focus with Department of Natural Resources and partnering organizations has been on rep riparian habitat, and primarily that along the Illinois and Mississippi rivers, in the Cypress Bayous of Southern Illinois and the remaining wetlands that are dotted throughout Northeast Illinois. Are there any plans in the works to increase the wetland and waterfowl nesting habitat in other parts of the state? I think this is something all three of you probably can chime in on, so I don't know who wants to go first. I, I can, I'll go first go. this time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, for DU's part, um, we are expanding our program to other regions of Illinois, but uh, Illinois is a big state and there's a lot of wetland conservation opportunity. So it sometimes just takes a project, a time to get projects rolling within any given region. Uh, something a lot of folks don't realize is any Ducks Unlimited project on average takes three years to complete. And that's from the time we say, yes, we will help. So uh, for example, if I say, yes, Randy, we will help you that state fish and wildlife area. If I tell him that today, we know that depending on what needs to be done um, and how large of a project, it could be two to three years before it's ready to move dirt on. And it could be four to five years before it's completely finished. Um, and a lot of that is just simply things I touched on earlier, uh, building the partnerships, uh, identifying the funding, going through the permitting, you know, working in wetlands, we, we go through a bit more permitting than, uh, you know, if, if we're working in an upland situation. Um, and then time of the season, we can't do wetland construction all year round because they're wetlands. 
Uh, in the, as we see in the Illinois River Valley, we've been essentially flooded um, for well over a year now, uh, which has delayed projects there. So we are expanding, it, it, it's taking time, um, but we also focus our conservation activities on regions in the state that, that are important to waterfowl historically, currently, and as we just touched on into the future. Um, within Northern Illinois, that's heavily breeding habitat and, and some migration habitat. In Central Illinois, we really are focused on migration habitat. And in, in Southern Illinois, um, we are focused on migration habitat and possibly a little bit more wintering habitat um, in the far tips and reaches of the state as the years go on. Um, <clears throat> however, each one of these programs took, took better part of a decade to build. So we are right now actively working to expand our breeding habitat program um, across all of Northern Illinois um, into East Central Illinois. Uh, we are looking at hopefully in the coming years beginning projects on the Upper Mississippi River, the Pecatonica River, the Rock River, the Green River, looking at important migration areas in the northern part of the state, as well as looking at some of the larger reservoir areas throughout the state and, and continue to expand our partnerships in Southern Illinois. Um, so we are looking to those areas. Um, I, I know it seems like it's taken forever and, and things do drag on, um, but DU, we are hopeful that in addition to those areas that, that Pete mentioned there, uh, we will expand um, into these areas he's, he's now asking about. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mike. I, I guess from a state perspective, too, um, you know, Illinois has is one of the states that has suffered some of the greatest wetland losses of any of the any of the states in the country. We've lost over 90 percent of our original wetlands. So from my perspective, any project that puts shallow water back on the landscape really anywhere in Illinois is valuable. Um, you know, obviously, if, if 90 percent of our original wetlands are gone, there is a whole lot of wetlands in a whole lot of places that, that aren't there anymore. Um, so projects any, anywhere really are, are important. That said, when we're talking about limited conservation funding, which funding is always limited when you're talking about conservation, um, we need to be as efficient as possible with those funds. And so as, as, um, as Pete mentions, you know, we're kind of focused on some of these riverine corridors and uh, Southern Illinois and Northeast Illinois. Well, a lot of that is due to the, the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan and typically the wetlands campaign of the, uh, of the Illinois Wildlife Action Plan. And that is kind of meant to guide conservation to be, to be as efficient as possible. So uh, looking at, you know, where, where wetlands are most dense, where uh, wetland dependent wildlife are uh, most dense, and then also where, um, you know, where recreation using those habitats takes place and, and trying to, um, you know, maximize our bang for the buck by putting, uh, putting habitat in places where it's needed. Again, that's not to say that it isn't needed everywhere. It certainly is. Um, but, um, you know, when we're talking about limited funding, we have to try to, um, I, I guess we just, it just comes down to efficiency. We have to try to spend it where, where we know it's going to have the biggest impact. Um, that said, there are some other folks, um, for instance, the, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, um, private lands folks and Pheasants Forever uh, have been working on a um, kind of a historic wetland complex that is uh, that is largely gone that would be in um, kind of I guess not too far into northeastern Illinois but um, in uh, the Livingston, Ford, and Iroquois County area there was a lot of historic kind of pothole like wetlands in that area uh, that had largely been lost and and they're doing a bunch of projects to restore those, those, you know, kind of uh, probably like two to 10 acre wetlands in that area and, and just seeing fantastic uh, results from it. Um, you know, things that had been, uh, hadn't had water on it in, you know, who knows how long, maybe a hundred years have, you know, wetland dependent wildlife, including ducks and geese on them within, pretty much within days or weeks of the water coming back to them. And, and we see really good habitat assemblages on those wetlands too. Um, after they 
uh, once they've been restored. So, so that's exciting, and I think probably a um, a has a lot of potential for a lot of other parts of the states as well. We just need to be um, cognizant of, uh, of of not trying to play Johnny Appleseed and spread our research so that we can um, really achieve something rather than just doing a little bit of work here, there, and anywhere. So that wraps up for the Q&A today on waterfall management in Illinois. Thank you, Randy and Aaron and Mike for joining us today. Um, if you missed sending in questions this time, we're gonna be hosting another Q&A next month on urban waterfowl. And so keep sending in those questions. Uh, until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you.